Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm not. Okay. <laughs> Guys, I'm not. I am not cooking. I am not cooking. Relax. I am not cooking. Thank you all for being here today so we can celebrate this incredible human being. Mm. I mean, you talk about the American dream, being here in a stage at South by Southwest with all of you and being next to a good friend and an amazing woman, amazing journalist, amazing voice, Michelle Norris herself. This is the American dream, guys. So we've all heard the phrase that this person needs no introduction, and that is sort of overused. But in Jose's case, it's true. You need no introduction. We know what you do. We see what you do across so many continents, across so many platforms, um, lifting people up through storytelling and doing it with food. And that's what we want to talk about today is how you use food. But I just want to take a minute to say something to you because I've known you a long time and I'm going to try not to get emotional. But I had the um, experience of we were on the same plane yesterday and walking through the airport with Jose. I've known Jose for a very, very long time. And to see the way people respond to you, I had not seen that. And the other word that is thrown around a lot is when we say someone is a saint. I think in this case it actually applies. <laughs> My um, wife is in the audience. <laughs> she, she's rolling her eyes. <laughs> I mean, she's been with me 30 years. And like, saint? Yeah, right. <laughs> well, you know, we all have our moments. <laughs> but I think that, that that definitely applies. And it's great to be here w with you at South by Southwest because the clip you just saw was from a film that, was, that premiered here last year. So it's kind of like a full service, full circle moment. And you've had so many wonderful moments here at South by Southwest. Um, you were um, on the team that did maybe a little bit bittersweet for you, but the karaoke contest with yeah. your friend Anthony Bourdain. Yeah, that um, was an amazing moment, but a sad moment when you see a photo, a moment like this, right? And in the wake of Hurricane uh, Maria, you were here to talk about your work in Puerto Rico and to raise awareness. And now you're here to talk about the journey that you've been on um, since then. But I wanna begin where it began, if we can. I wanna take you back um, to the roots and how you developed an interest in, in not just food, but in creating spaces at the table. Um, the, the actress Felicia Rashad once told me that truly powerful people are always making spaces at the table. The table is never big enough. And that certainly applies applies to you. What did you see, read, smell, experience as a very young man that set you on this journey? You know, uh, you realize that you become who you are thanks to the people that you have around you. But not necessarily your family or people you have direct contact with, mm -hmm. but goes beyond that, right? Movies you see, books you may read. And it's many moments like this that start without you realizing, creating with, within you the DNA of who you are. Mm -hmm. My mom, my father, nurses, as I tell you, watching them in action beyond duty, seeing them and their friends in the hospital, you know, reading a book to a young boy waiting for his family, even when they're their work day already ended. Those moments of, of empathy. But my mom sending me to the Red Cross to learn about how to, to do, you know, mouth to mouth and trying to bring some back to life. You did that as, as a very young as, man. As, as a young man, or who was going to tell me years later the Hamlet maneuver will be something I could use to help somebody. It's those moments, right? Those, those connections, stories, actions, people that tell you why this is important, that in a way, uh, my life began creating, learning about Clara Barton. Mm -hmm. How many of you know Clara Barton? All right. For me, Mayan, when in D.C., around 1996, they discovered an apartment, a house, red brick mortar, across the first restaurant I opened in D.C. in 1993. 
That was the house and the offices of the missing soldier's office. Clara Barton, a nurse like my mom, was this amazing woman that out of nothing, she was able not only to run the flying hospitals uh, during the Civil War, saving countless of lives, but then when the Civil War was ended, ended he was trying to find what happened to loved ones of so many families that they were trying to put closure to, to knowing where they die or where are they. You see, when I learned about Clara Barton, there is this moment that also, uh, my brain is telling me, if Clara Barton was a nurse like, like my mom, and Clara Barton had the talent to take care of the few, but Clara Barton, in the process, found a way to try to, to do more. She created the American Red Cross, a nurse taking care of one person at a time, at the end created a movement that probably she even couldn't dream of, but all began by one action, one moment. You see, that story, she told me that story in the distance, in time, by learning about her, about her actions. And at the end is what I say, that we are all the product of all those stories and all those people. People we hear and we touch and we know, but far away people in time, in distance, or in history, that in a way they are all these voices that keep making the person we become. You know, when we tell stories, you never know who you're going to impact. I, I, it's hard to imagine that John Steinbeck thought that across the decades that he might have an impact on someone like you. You're in Spain, you're reading about the Jode family in the Dust Bowl in Oklahoma, and all these years later, that story resonates in some, some way. It's important to tell stories because you don't know who needs to hear it. Whatever there is a fight, so hungry people will eat, mm -hmm. I will be there. The main character said, now we copy that, we took this away, and everybody in Wolfsandra Kitchen very much will respond to you. We will be there. You see, big problems sometimes, they have very simple solutions. What we've been doing, putting those words of Jonas Stenberg himself, and putting boots on the ground, and being there, one meal at at the time is sometimes how you can start hoping to change the world. You know, I, I've always been in, intrigued by the way you use storytelling. When I was, um, I used to host a show on National Public Radio called All Things Considered, and I, and we did a, no, we, we did a segment where we interviewed a lot of people about, we gave all these chefs $10 and said, how do you feed a family? Do you remember this? How do you feed a family of four with just $10? The country was in a recession, thought it was a good idea. Um, and we interviewed you. And you decided to cook a dish that is very important to you. It was something that, that Patricia had made for you, right? The garbanzo stew. You can find it online. It's actually delicious. I suggest you find the recipe. But when we taped that segment, we went out in the field and we did it. And you decided that you wanted, you insisted, in fact, that we do it at World, excuse me, at DC Central Kitchen at the time. And, and I remember I had to go back and they, they wanted to bring you in a studio because the kitchen is loud and for an audio engineer, it was, it was a nightmare because it was this big loud kitchen and you insisted and so we did it. And it wound up being beautiful because you could hear all this noise in the background but the reason that you wanted to do it always stuck with me, that you wanted to let the people know who worked at DC Central Kitchen that their work was so important that a national broadcast was going to come and be in their realm and show what they did, or at least tape what they did, so people could hear it the world over. So that was a super important, yep. I mean, Michelle has been so brilliant in so many ways. I mean, this give a chef $10 and see how he can come up with a menu to to, to feed a family uh, on a budget. Um, uh, I think that was brilliant because this ignited a lot of things. It's like your amazing six war project about race that, would, that has been fascinating. So you have a talent into igniting others to do things and I, I love you for it. This obviously was, has been a love affair of my life, being one more volunteer in this central kitchen because there is where I began learning hands-on, very young, the power of food 
to change the world. Uh, and realizing that we all have a talent that goes beyond what we believe, and that we all need to believe more in ourselves, because we are all more powerful than what we even realize. I'm a cook, and you could argue, even if you know my friends and family complain all the time about my cooking. Who complains too, about too much your salt, cooking? too little this, too small, too smoky? Oh my God, people are so opinionated. <laughs> uh, I realized that I have the talent to feed the few. But if you believe in yourself, you have that same talent to feed the many. This is Central Kitchen was this place. I got there through my friend and partner, uh, Rob Wilder, who also we co-founded World Central Kitchen together. And he was the chairman at the time. And I he's was here cook. today, and we should show him some love. Rob. And he's the guy that gave me my first job in Washington, D.C. He didn't know what he was doing. <laughs> I mean, they couldn't find anybody else. That's why they hired me. <laughs> but the long story short is, obviously, opening Haleo, my Spanish restaurant, changed my life in more ways than one. But going to DC Central Kitchen and meeting the founder, Robert Egger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Robert Egger is a fascinating human because he was a bartender and saw waste happening in the restaurants. And he thought, we need to make sure that we have no more waste. But he was the brilliant guy that said, but the conversation is the wrong one. Everybody is talking about food waste. Wrong. Forget food waste. What we are doing by wasting food is that actually we are wasting people. We are wasting the lives of people. So he began bringing that food waste food and use food, and began bringing the most important part, the people, ex-convicts, ex-homeless, training them to be cooks, in the process making meals to feed the homeless population of Washington, D.C. And there is where I saw that we should be stopping throwing money at the problem, but investing in the solution. Robert Egger, remember this phrase, because I wish I came up with it, but I didn't. He said, philanthropy seems is always about the redemption of the giver. Yeah. When philanthropy must be about the liberation of the receiver. It's a brilliant phrase. Because we should be in the business of investing in people so they can hope to have the same life like I have and to belong to the community in the same way I belong. And this is Central Kitchen allow all that to happen. Why I want you not to take me to the studio to do those espinacas, uh, garbanzos con espinacas, spinach with, with, with chickpeas, my home or my restaurant, because that's the people that needed to be heard. Those the people that need to be seen. Do you know how many times we have a hunger conference and everybody talking in the hunger conference has never been hungry? <laughs> How are we going to be finding solutions to the problem if we don't listen to the stories of the people that are facing those problems? By me bringing you to the kitchen was a way to give voice to those people. And, and let's just show the picture again of the people who actually work at World Central Kitchen, because I want you to look them in the eye and see that many of them now have matriculated, have moved on, are working in restaurants in DC, are leading different kinds of lives. So as you say, when we're talking about food waste, we're also talking about people who too often are treated as if they are disposable. Sometimes we, 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 get, we get confused of what we're trying to do. Uh, when we talk about, you know, so many cities in America, neighborhoods, poor neighborhoods, the mothers, because then, le let's remember who feeds America and who feeds the world. It's not boys like me. The seven plus, almost eight billion people on planet Earth, mm -hmm. they're all being fed by women. Women are at the heart of feeding the world. <laughs> and that's something we need just to recognize and start giving tools. When we need to make sure that every neighborhood in America will be with a market, where we will have no food deserts, this is something like we should be ha making happen in a month. Because by not having markets in the poor neighborhoods in America, 
Who is suffering that lack of infrastructure? Unfortunately, are the women that they carry all the burden of feeding the families. Not like the burden should not be shared by all. It has to. In my home, I'm okay. I love to cook and my wife knows it. But the truth is that until we don't start changing the way the system runs, people are going to be poor only because we are not telling the story that is really making them poor. And sometimes not having training, not having access to a market, not having it's certain things that they are totally disconnected one from each other. But when you put them in the same story together and you explain the story as one problem that actually have very simple solutions, when those stories are told them one day, we can input policy, we can input what our politicians think and do, but those stories are gonna have to be vital. So all of us, we need to be storytellers because it's the only way we will convince people to come up with the right, in this case, talking politics, the right policies that happens is always a smart politics. So let's talk about being a storyteller because people often think about storytellers with the capital S and it's people who write books, people who sit behind a microphone, people who have a big platform, and, and that, that probably describes you. It, in some points in my life has described me. But everyone can be a storyteller, and you, and you demonstrate that. You used Twitter to, as, or as my mother calls it, the Twitter, <laughs> to great effect early on to help people know about your mission, to help people know what was going on um, in, in, in Puerto Rico. Uh, you also, when you go to places, you, you use the story, use stories in, in very interesting ways. Your menu tells a story. When you walk into a restaurant, the decor tells a story. So can you talk a little bit about the mantra that you live under, that you don't open restaurants, that you create um, platform, you tell stories. You're not just opening a restaurant, well, you're using that culinary experience to tell a story. Yeah, I mean, it's true. For me, opening a restaurant was, is a great thing because you, you cook. But I realized very early on when people thank me for, oh, Jose, thank you for bringing Spanish cooking to America. And I'm, I'm looking at myself at the mirror. I'm like, thank you. I mean, it's the only thing I know. But I realized that what I was doing every time I put the dish on the menu, I was telling the story of, of my mother uh, and in the process of every mother in Spain making croquetas. You know the bechamel fritters? This audience is hungry. You just mentioned croquetas, and everybody just went, mmm. So croquetas, people forget, and this has to do with the $10 challenge. My mom will be a magician, because you know when the fridge looks like a Best Buy commercial? <laughs> that the fridge is always empty, yeah. which I don't understand. If I was a salesman, I would fill up the fridge. <laughs> but anyway, the fridges are always empty for some reason, clean. OK, the, the fridge in my house will be empty like a Best Buy commercial. But my mom will always find something. The piece of ham, dry, like you could stand up on its own, you know? <laughs> uh, the, the egg that was so hard already with creatures growing in the surface. No, but hey, hello, it's rock and roll. I mean, it's blue cheese, it's that. <laughs> my mom will get that, we'll chop it. And she will make the bechamel with flour, and, and she will make the croquetas. Of everything was left over because maybe it was no more money home uh -huh. until the next paycheck. She will carry with that nonstop. That story is one that is still in my, mm -hmm. in my brain. And that my mom will make with the old bread, the bread, crumbs using the coffee grinder. That's why the coffee in my house was always so thick, because they forgot. <laughs> and she'll roll the bechamel in the bread. Mm -hmm. That's a story I love to tell, because I'm not telling the story. My mom was not telling me the story. The sequence of events, I was part of the story. I was part of the story of, of love, because my mom cooking for us was love. Responsibility, probably, even if she didn't love us, she had the responsibility to, I have to feed those bastards, <laughs> little creatures, was a, an understanding of, of, of 
of doing whatever she, she could with the resources she had. Uh, that's why this story, I love to tell the story, but in a way my mom told me this story without words, mm -hmm. just with actions. Those are Trojan horses. They're Trojan horses that make you understand exactly what's happening. Mm -hmm. And me, I love to see now, these stories, like if I travel back 40 years in time, and I could be there just as a spectator and see the entire sequence of events and everything was happening there that was far away more than just my mom cooking and feeding mm -hmm. my brothers and I. It was many stories all happening at one. Um, that's why for me, my restaurants, when I have these croquetas, is just no croquetas that, by the way, I cannot believe I'm charging $10 for five croquetas <laughs> and you are all buying them. <laughs> because my mom will make that with sense. But in the process, those croquetas that you are ordering in my restaurant, you may know or you may not know, but I guarantee you every time you bring one of those croquetas to your mouth, even if you are unaware, that story is becoming part of who you are. That croqueta is becoming a Trojan horse of you understanding a little bit more maybe about me, maybe about the Spanish cooking, or maybe about those mothers and grandmothers trying to feed a family almost without nothing. Mm -hmm. It's a fascinating way how those stories become part of you, even if you are not even looking at the story or at the storytelling itself. You know, you tell the story about how you, you wonder why people are paying so much for croquetas. My mother always says that when we go in a restaurant and there's jambalaya on the menu. Jambalaya. Because where I come from, jambalaya was the, what do we have left in the, in the refrigerator that we can just throw in a pot with a bunch of rice. And I, don't, I, I thought that jambalaya basically meant on Tuesdays, you use whatever is left in the refrigerator. You know, I thought that that's how it translated. Um, and that's different cultures have different versions of that. Th there's a story that, that you tell that shows that you are not just teaching people, but you're also sopping up other people's stories. The story that you tell over and over again about black beans and, you know, and learning how another culture, because often what people do when they enter another culture is they overlay their own expectations, assumptions, and that's one of the interesting things that you've done with World Central Kitchen is to go in as someone who has lived many places, but to go in with an open mind and an open heart and an open palate. So instead of deciding what a community needs, that you go in and you listen first. Yeah. Well, this was a huge one because uh, after 2010, I go a few weeks later to Port au Prince through Dominican Republic with the help of a local Spanish NGO as you remember, hundreds of thousands of Haitians die. Um, every, the international aid was, was good, but the chaos and the, and the, and the, and the death and the, and the amount of people that lost their homes was, was, was huge. So I, I went there to learn. I didn't, I didn't go there to feed anybody. I went there to learn. Mm -hmm. I already watched what happened in Katrina when we left thousands of people in the Superdome without food. I began having this kind of urgency to understand how cooks like me, we could be more active in helping bring food. But this story uh, in particular for me was very important because I am cooking these amazing black beans. They were in season, the market in Haiti was full of them in Port au Prince. And I'm using solar kitchens, I love solar kitchens, and other kitchens I had at my disposal was this probably four or 500 people camp. And I had all these women helping me cook. And they were singing and they were happy and it took us six, seven hours to make these beans. And, and at the end when we are about to serve, they all come with the help of a translator. And they were like, what happened? Yeah, they wanna tell you something. I'm like, what, what do they wanna tell me? Like, yeah, that, that they love the beans you've, you've cooked and they appreciate all the energy and love and coming here every day to feed them. But, that the way you are cooking these beans is not the way they like to eat the beans. <laughs> and this is the, the story of my life. You tell you, everybody's opinionated about my cooking. I'm like, really? <laughs> I am Jose Andres. I have a TV show in Spain. <laughs> I have restaurants. I've been in the cover of Washington Post, even nobody knew who I was or why. Like, I'm a big deal somewhere, but <laughs> really? Man. You know, F-U-C-K ego, right? 
And this was a huge moment in my life. Because they are, people don't want our pity. People want our respect. <laughs> and when we come to tell people that we are coming to help, hey, this is what you need, it feels very disrespectful. Even if your idea may be great, they need to be an idea they believe in, because it's the only way it's going to have success. So we got, I don't know how, it took us two hours, they smashed the beans, because we, it's not like we had a blender. But they were happy. And it took two, three more hours. And at the end, the black beans, they were not all these beans floating in my stock, like, you know. It was this velvety, beautiful, silky, shiny black bean soup that they will eat next to a little humble plate of rice. Mm -hmm. No mix. They'll do the mixing themselves in the way they feel appropriate. Because me, I was about to put the black bean on top of the rice. I'm like, what are you doing? I'm like, man, this is so hard. You forget Michelin. Michelin guy, this is easier. <laughs> you know, you do 12 seats and they give you two stars. You're like, boom. Here is like, holy cow. But this was an unbelievable moment in my, in, my, in my life. Probably now, everywhere I go, with Wall Sandra Kitchen, Obviously, we cook local and what locals want, because that's a way to give them respect. But at the same time, it's the smartest thing. If you are in Haiti in the black bean season and you have black beans, it's better than trying to do, I don't know, uh, chickpeas if they don't have chickpeas. What locals love is usually what locals have. And what locals love and locals have is the smartest thing to do. And if they have been through trauma, a taste of home is so important to them, right? It's something very amazing that happened that I, it's a story that keeps feeding its own. We were in Bahamas, thousands of Haitians die. Probably their death are still unrecognized to this day because on paper they were undocumented, which is still I don't understand go, how we can have anywhere in the world undocumented. Anybody that born on planet Earth belongs to planet Earth. Therefore, everybody is a person. We, we can use it for political charge speeches, but people are people, even if some people don't want to give that right to people. But in Haiti, unfortunately, in, in Bahamas, many die. Uh, I, we landed in Abaco within hours after the Hurricane Dorian left, and there was a lot of people in Nassau, Haitians, mm -hmm. in some of the shelters. We got permission by the whole government of Bahamas to bring some of the cooks we had in Haiti and we began cooking the, the Haitian dishes in Bahamas that the Haitian population live. And you do that often. You this take is the story that keeps feeding itself. And, they, and you take people forward. So you had people who were cooking in Ukraine that are helping in Syria. You had people who were cooking in one place that move with you and help you someplace else. We, we, we do. Uh, actually, I just came back from Turkey. And was something very important that happened there. The, Ukrainian government is very thankful of the help Turkey has been providing to Ukraine. So they send 80 firefighters, search and rescue team members, even when their country is under missile Which attacks. Which is incredible. Like, with and they send 90 on. firefighters to help and rescue people in, in Turkey. But also, members of Wolsen Dragicin from Ukraine, they, they requested and they drove for thousands of miles they drove all the way to Turkey to join also the feeding operations. So in a way, these are the stories that keep repeating themselves, the stories that feed themselves. And it's very beautiful to see through people, through food. Uh, uh, this is, is a story that forever keeps building, creating this amazing, unique, uniqueness kind of universe of people that in more ways than one keep sharing and are part of the same story. You run toward danger repeatedly. When something happens in the world and you know that people are facing trauma, um, that they are losing their, everything that is important to them, you will run toward that and you are able to set up operations very quickly, usually within 24 to 36 hours. This is something that a lot of very large organizations, government organizations, NGOs, frankly corporate 
structures have a very hard time doing. What is your secret? How is it that you are able to move so quickly and to be so nimble when so many other people who have been doing this for decades, and in some cases centuries, still struggle with this? Yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> no, I, because I don't. Because obviously the, the, this is not me, Jose, the person. This is we, the people. Mm -hmm. Is this amazing team members of World Central Kitchen that we already reach over 10 million meals in Turkey and Syria? Is this an amazing group of individuals that we've done already over 110 million meals in Ukraine? So how we how we do it? What's the mindset? Do you do you, is it a case where too many other people think I can't call that person? They're too busy, or the rule okay. says I can't call them. What is it that you're able I'm, to do? I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you one thing. I need you to believe. World Central Kitchen today, and for the last 13 years, we are the biggest organization in the history of mankind. <laughs> Who are you laughing? <laughs> yeah, my partner. So and that, that, I, and that's, I laugh, a, that's a big statement. And I laugh too. But now let me tell you why. And then I think I answer your question. Because in the way we think it, you remember I mentioned the Superdome? You remember that moment? Thousands of Americans, people from the low nine. You know what a, an arena is? A stadium is? Don't say anything because you're going to be wrong. An arena, a stadium, everybody thinks it's a place for sports, your NBA team, or, or for music, your favorite musician, concert. But it's wrong. An arena is a gigantic restaurant that entertains with sports and musicians. <laughs> Everybody is always eating. I never see anybody watching the game. Everybody is in the. <laughs> everybody is waiting in line for the hot dog and the and the fries. So why we didn't open up all the food courts inside the Superdome within one hour to start feeding people? In the last hurricane, I was in New Orleans and we got short by a food company. You know what we did that morning? We got on a truck, we drove. We went to the food warehouses of New Orleans, which by the way, they were full of food. Everybody always says that we are brilliant because we are able to find food. And I'm like, brilliant? <laughs> like, wh where do you find the food, Jose? I'm like, in the food stores? <laughs> It's like, I wish I was ready. I mean, we go to the food warehouses. So let's go back. The food warehouses of New Orleans are 0.7 miles away from the Superdome. It was never a reason we will leave people for days hungry and without water. Now let's go back on my affirmation that World Central Kitchen is the biggest organization in the history of mankind. Because... During the pandemic, we activated 3,500 restaurants in America alone. In the way we think, every restaurant, every food truck, every catering company in the airports, every, every food store, every food warehouse, every person, every driver that is part of World Central Kitchen, what happens is they don't know it yet. <laughs> but in the way we think, it's like we have all these assets at our disposal. Why we were able to reach 350,000 meals a day in Turkey so quickly? Because we activated 12 of our own kitchens, food six, eight of our food trucks, 50, 60 Turkish restaurants all across more than 10, 12 big cities and hundreds of small towns. That's what we were able to be doing, three, 400,000 meals a day, because we went there with the open mind of saying, what are the assets? And just asking the people, hey, we need you to join us, and we want to join you. And usually the answer is always the same one. Let's do it. That's what we are able to be always so quick and so fast. And you told me once that you're not burdening people, you're actually giving them an opportunity. That when you ask someone to do something, it's not that you're asking them to, to, to do something that is going to be burdensome. You're actually lifting them up. 
Well, in, unfortunately, in the worst moments of humanity, is when the best of humanity shows up. In the middle of chaos and mayhem, there you never see Republicans or Democrats. There you never see Christians or Jewish or Muslims. There you don't see black or white. There you see people next to people. People helping people. Longer tables, no higher walls. That's the world we all need to believe in. If, if the audience will indulge us, there's just a small clip that I want to, want to call up, if that's OK with you, that shows um, the point of what you're making. The point that you're making here is that we know you. But for every place that you land, there is an army of people who have found their purpose, who are working, they're making sandwiches, they're driving trucks, they're sweeping floors. And let's just take a listen to this. I am in Poland, got in earlier today. I'm actually here on the, the border with Ukraine, and this is one Ukraine of and Romania. Today we are uploading our car wagon number 500. First June, it's an international kids day. Hi guys, I'm from Vinica. Today we are in Trostinets. I want to say thank you for your support, for being with us, for praying for Ukraine. Slava Ukraine, we will win. Spend a minute talking about the individuals that do this work for you. Um, what I, we know, we can intuit what you mean to them. What do they mean to you? Well, they don't do it for me. I, I'm just one more volunteer. I mean, when I go to these missions, I try used to be one more guy. Uh, I bring the experience I have, but, but I'm always going to learn. Um, I keep going and leaving my restaurants and my family and and my friends, and, and, and my terrible golf games that I never hit the ball, <laughs> uh, and my scuba diving. Because for me, it's becoming increasingly difficult uh, knowing that you can do something about it, not to be there. So what you see here, uh, what was the name of this, of this thing? Is something about the stories? How did we call this thing when we were doing you and I? Storytelling? Storytelling? Ah, story, yeah. It's, my English is very bad. <laughs> Probably was Sandra Gitchen over the last years, and, and I know now we, we have uh, a lot of people that follow Paul Sandra Kitchen. When you see every one of these men and women doing these reports, very often it's some of the first news we have of many places. And they are told by people like you and I. And World Central Kitchen is an organization that is, we are empowered by you, the people, to take care of the people. The people helping people with no red tape. And these videos, which we have thousands of them, that now every member of World Central Kitchen that likes social media or likes to speak to the camera, which by the way, this, to put a camera in a phone for an organization like World Central Kitchen, it's been very powerful. Because in these videos you see the people that are making it happen, not claiming what they will do tomorrow. I promise you I will end unemployment. I promise you I will provide uh, health care to every person. We know who these people are, and they are good people. But sometimes they promise things they don't even know what, what to do with. But these are people that when they promise you something, they're not promising you what they will do tomorrow. They are showing you what they are doing right now. And this is the world we need of people that are doers, no people that keep promising. No huge speeches somewhere where we all clap, like if we are seals in the zoo and we're giving a sardine and we all clap. And we never follow up in what happened with those promises. What you see there are people making it happen. And that's the world we all need. All of us here, we are people that we can make it happen. So when I see these people, I often cry. When I see these videos, because I realize that 
Right now, as we speak, we have people feeding in San Bernardino when communities got covered in California by snow, that we are feeding people in Syria. Uh, even when I have people that tell them, ah, you are not in Syria. Like, yeah, we are in Syria. What happens sometimes is dangerous to tell that we have a lot of people in Syria for other reasons. We are in Turkey. We are, I wish we could be in every single place. The organization is only 80 people. The great thing about our organization, and that's where you see here so many faces, is that we allow locals to join us in a way no other organization allows. We realize that we are better if locals are the ones taking charge. We bring, obviously, the infrastructure, obviously, the money, the know-how, the experience, the push. But very often, very quickly, are the locals helping locals? So those videos are the men and women of World Central Kitchen that leave everything behind. Even when sometimes people lost their homes, or lost loved ones. It's people that they decide the best way I can be helping is used with boots on the ground and standing next to my people. So for me, every time I go on a mission, uh, I feel like I try to go everywhere because I try to give as many thanks and feasts and hugs as I can. But more important, thank you. Because those are the people that really are believing that we can change the world by being there. I've been with Woods on the Ground. So when, every time I see these videos, I always have tears in my eyes. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes I want to be there next to them. But because sometimes I know how hard is what they do. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> we, we, we lost, and now my, my dory brain is not helping me, but, but we lost two people in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, I, I am not, you know, I'm the founder of World Central Kitchen. I'm not like, I'm not the CEO, I'm not the chairman of the board, I'm, I'm nothing. Technically, I have no title. But, but I have this kind of weight that when those two people die, you know, there are people that they still, we need to do more for them and their families, but they die feeding. They die risking themselves. They, they, it's not like they die because World Central Kitchen is telling them, be there feeding in risky situations. Every time I tell somebody, don't do this, it's too risky. I'm like, what are you talking about, Jose? This is our country. We are already under risk. A missile can hit anywhere, any moment. But this is not used to be feeling in a war zone. This can be happening in Turkey, where buildings kept falling during days and weeks after the first two earthquakes. Um, this can be happening in hurricanes, when it can be slides, when you go up in the mountains, and still things keep happening because the terrain is very insecure and very wet. In the process of feeding, many of these people sometimes they are putting themselves in danger. But they, I don't remember who was that person one day that I was like, be careful, be careful. And, and, and the truth is that the person told me something in the sense of, of we're never going to be really changing, changing the world if we don't all take risks. We must all take risks if we want to change the world. When my daughter Ines, who is here with us, and very much told me something in the same lines. I took her with me to Poland, mm -hmm. and I was going inside to Labiv because we were doing operations inside. We're talking March. And I wanted to leave my daughter in Poland. And my daughter Ines told me something like, Daddy, how do you want me to learn about the world we live in if I don't take risks? Mm -hmm. I do believe we are in a moment in this beginning of the 21st century people that we all together, all we need to be supporting each other, and we need to start writing new recipes, and we need to start all taking more risks. Because if we don't take risks and we don't write new recipes, I'm afraid that the same old recipes are not good enough to improve the world we live in. Let's all support each other. Let's all be next to each other. Let's all take risks. And together, yes, we can achieve a lot of things. In this case, one plate of food at a time. So, speaking of writing new recipes, uh, you have a, an announcement to make about something special that you're going to be serving up this fall that will feature the work of World Central Kitchen yep. um, and also feature several of your friends who are serving up their wisdom and their recipes. Can we reveal this to the room? Yeah. yeah. So I think this is being by popular demand. 
One of the things we've been having the biggest requests, because we cook real food in real countries with real ingredients and real people. In Colombia, in Providencia, we, keep, we cook Rondon, a crazy stew with, 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 with coconut milk and mm. conch and red snapper and pork. I never heard about Rondon. In, in, in Bahamas, uh, 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 we cook fire engine. Did you ever had a fire engine? What is a fire engine? Why are you waiting to go to Bahamas? <laughs> the fire engine is the most amazing dish. And, and I never heard about it. And I keep going to missions and you learn about dishes that they are part of the people. Actually, they are the people. And, and we are cluel, clueless. You know, me as a chef, and probably happens to you in your area of expertise. Everybody thinks that the chef knows everything about everything. And me, as I'm growing older, the more I know about cooking, is the more I know I know nothing. You know how many cookings are out there in the world? Even in my own country where I come from, Spain, I'm clueless about every dish. So one of the things we've been doing in Walls and Dragons is sharing the amazing cooks that bring the best of their countries in the middle, in the middle of an activation. And this has become very traditional in the World Central Kitchen, Twitter and Facebook and other, and Instagrams and others. People requested, can I get the recipe? In my own uh, Twitter account, can I get the recipe? I'm like, really? They don't ask me about my recipes and they're asking about the recipes of everybody else? Yeah, again, you see, nobody wants my cooking. Well, no. We, we... So at the end, was the idea that came by many, uh, and all the World Central Kitchen teams celebrates it. What if we put all the recipes which tell the stories of the people, many of them women in majority, that has been helping World Central Kitchen feed people in emergencies? So, at the end of this year somewhere, the World Central Kitchen cookbook is coming. We have recipes for many of these men and women that made possible to World Central Kitchen to reach hundreds and hundreds of millions of meals. This is going to be 100% raising money to help World Central Kitchen to keep doing what they do. So if you want to keep being part of the story of the men and women of World Central Kitchen, trying to bring hope in the middle of mayhem, one plate of food at a time, you can already pre-order the book. It will be available on September 12th. And there you have the QR code. So you can start ordering the book. And, and World Central Kitchen will be part of your house, of your kitchen. And there's many ways to help. This is one. Not everybody can go to an emergency. But this is another way that people want to be part of who we are. They do it connecting with the videos. They do it connecting with from racing. This book, I believe, will be another great way for people connecting with the people. And it's more than a cookbook. It really chronicles your journey. And you can't talk about the fire engine and not tell us what it is. <laughs> what is the fire engine? I think you're going to have to buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. Can we, can we this, at least have This is a politician's story? answer to tell you I don't really remember. <laughs> but it's like a spam. Every time it's a spam somewhere, you know you're good. But it's fascinating. It has rice and has vegetables. Uh, but I fell in love with that, that dish. I mean, I'm going back to Bahamas very soon. And for me, it's emotional sometimes because I try to go. I'm going for fun, and I have a restaurant there. But I love to go to those communities. We spend a lot of time. I spent myself almost 30 days in the early days of the earthquake, of the hurricane in Bahamas, like other places. And you, you become attached to the people, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and the recipes become destroying horse in your life. Uh, become a Trojan horse because becomes part of who you are. Yeah. Becomes part of your storytelling. That's why cookbooks is not about the recipes, but cookbooks is about the people that made the recipes possible. Yeah. And in that book, you're going to discover amazing individuals. We cannot put everybody, but you're going to find amazing individuals that when humanity needed amazing angels, those were the angels that began feeding humanity. That's, that's, and the that's black, an homage to all of them. The black bean recipe is in the cookbook. The black bean recipe is there. <laughs>
And you have, there are other people who are contributing to the cookbook, Michelle Obama. We, we, we have, well, we, we had to have, you know, Stephen Colbert is part of the book because he's been always supporting Wolfgang Dragicin in so many ways. Then I got Jimmy Fallon upset, so I, I think he's also gonna be. <laughs> no, no, he got upset with me, like, really? Because Stephen brought the forward, but I have another one with Jimmy because Jimmy also supports a lot Wolfgang Dragicin, but Obviously, we, we, you know, we, we, we had the famous names, Aisha Curry and, and Marcus Samuelson. Marcus Samuelson, uh, Marcus is this amazing chef, has an amazing story, African, Swedish, American. I don't know even if he knows where he's from, because he's from everywhere at once. In the middle of the pandemic, uh, himself, yes, he's a Food Network chef, super successful chef, but on day one of the pandemic, he was there in Bronx, Everywhere in Newark, feeding people. You see, he's not there because he's Marcus Samuelson, the Food Never star. He's Marcus Samuelson because he was there feeding his people, our people, when they needed the most. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be a, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, it's going to be a woman called Carla Hoyos. Carla is Puerto Rican. Uh, Carla, she's going to kill me. Carla is Mexican. <laughs> oh my God. I, I gave an interview in Turkish television, and I say, my Puerto Rican friend, Carla Hoyos. Carla Hoyos, single-handed in Puerto Rico, ran the big convention center that we were doing 75,000 meals a day, and she was the woman in charge of 75,000 meals a day in Maria. In Turkey, in Turkey, she arrived to Gaziantep, and in 24 hours, single-handed, with a lot of Turkish people, he put one of the quickest kitchens we had, reaching 10, 20,000 meals a day. This is the type of people are gonna be in the book. No people, people that walk, mm -hmm. that walk the so walk. So it's, it's not just the big name people whose names you recognize. You're gonna meet people you've never met who have been doing yeah. amazing things. Michelle Obama has been very supportive and, and I don't think anybody is gonna be criticizing that she wanted to be contributing a recipe. Michelle has been an inspiration for many, but she's been always also in different ways supporting um, World Central Kitchen. Um, it's gonna be this woman, Aline uh, Kamakian. I met her in Beirut. Aline was cooking 12 hours after the explosion in Beirut. And that's the location she was when the explosion destroyed half of the city. Yeah. She couldn't hear. She had a big ear, very big damage. Uh, but the doctors told her she had to be in the hospital. But she says, I'm not staying in the hospital. She went to her kitchen and she began cooking. She was one of the first kitchens we activated in the Beirut explosion response. Aline, she's obviously have a recipe, but no, it's because the recipe is beyond what the recipe does. This is people committed to be next to the people. In, in the most difficult moments, I said before, the best of humanity shows up. People like this, sometimes they tell me, I never imagined I will be part of something like this. Mm. They say, this is bigger than myself. But actually, it's people like this that makes all of us who we are. Humanity is thankful to have people like them. Because when we see ourselves in them, right. you know there is hope. You know there is a better tomorrow. And you can, as one person, you can change a community, you can get up. Now, we, we note that people can buy the cookbook to support World Central Kitchen, but this is a room full of creatives, people who do things, people who have very busy schedules, people who have deadlines. And so it's not always easy for them to drop everything and run toward danger, run toward trauma, run toward disaster in the way that you and some of your volunteers do. But what can they do? to support World Kitchen, or well, what can they do to stand up similar efforts in their own community? Because you got a room full of storytelling. Unfor unfortunately, obviously, things will happen in your community. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, you'll receive the call. You, you know, when we talk about ending hunger in the world, we're not gonna do it trying to say, let's see, let's end hunger in the world. You can do it just by one plate of food. One plate of food at a time sometimes, is the way to start. Big problems have very simple solutions. All of you have a talent. Sometimes can be you amplifying a message through your social media. Sometimes maybe you sharing your expertise with others that you can be helping them to become better. Sometimes can be you going to a soup kitchen. Sometimes can be helping make the next bill that can end 
poverty in America and, and through school lunches. Uh, everybody has a way. Obviously, with World Central Kitchen, World Central WCK.org, this is a simple way. Obviously, being part of buying the book and supporting the book, that's a, another way. But what we need all to remember that we all need to have a very big belief in ourselves. All of you have talents that you didn't reach to its limits. All here, all of us at South by Southwest that we keep coming back every year. This is a very important, beautiful, powerful community. I know if something happens, my, the community of South by Southwest will always be next to us. And that belief that we are as good as the people we have around us, and really believe it. And knowing that you will be there for me as one day I will be there for you. And people that you don't know right now that you're sitting next to it, they can be the person that helps you tomorrow. We all need to have bigger faith in humanity. We all need to take more risk. We all need to believe in each other and use to end. Let's stop throwing money at the problem. Let's stop use helping any organization out there because it seems it's the right thing to do. Remember what I told you. Philanthropy must stop being about the redemption of the giver. Philanthropy must be about the liberation of the receiver. When we help with time, with money, with, with know-how, we need to make sure that we push those organizations, especially the biggest ones, of are you delivering on your promise? If you're not, move aside and let the new organizations move in. Before we let you go, your family is here. And I think um, the room would also like to thank Patricia and the girls, because when you're out in the world, it means there's an empty seat at your table. And so thank you for sharing this incredible human being with us. We knew that this conversation was going to be delicious, and it delivered. Jose, Andreas, thank you so much for what you do. Thank you. My friend. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, guys. We love you. World Central Kitchen.